Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. I'm very happy to be welcoming my friend Meg Sippy to the podcast today. And Meg is a flute player who then transitioned into arts management and arts leadership. And this is a path that I've been really fascinated by because I think some of the best arts leaders are former performers um, and arts makers. So welcome to the podcast, Meg. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Michael. Thank yes, you for inviting me. Yeah, it's a ha pleasure to have you on. And we met all the way back in 2006 and we were both making a transition around that same time. And I was going from working for my union to then going into arts management with the League of American Orchestras Fellowship Program. And you had um, been playing flute and then were starting into the world of opera management. Yes. For sure. So tell us a little bit about your journey and how you started in music, first of all, and, and flute, and then how you how you pivoted. Okay, so, um, so I'm a, I was a flutist, or I'm a flutist, I guess my friends say, still t tell yourself you're a flutist, Meg, but I started, you know, like everyone does, or hopefully at least by fourth grade on the flute after playing piano for a couple of years, and I liked it, and you know, once you find out that you're kind of good at something, then you you go into it a little bit more, you practice more. And then in high school, you know, I had older brothers and sisters that like to have fun. So I learned that it's fun to also have a great group of friends. So I didn't folk, I mean, I practiced all the time and I went to interlock and in the summers, but I also was like having fun. And then I realized I want to do this for my life. So I went to college at Michigan State and specifically because of the flute teacher there, um, like everybody does, it's in performance, you figure out which teacher you want to study with. And I absolutely loved it. And then after that, I was fortunate to go to the Eastman School of Music and study with Bonnie Boyd. And I was definitely on the, the track that I wanted to be a professional musician, playing in an orchestra. I loved it. And I did the Aspen Music Festival in school for a few summers and did some various things, go to Europe with the Eastman School in the summer. Anyway, you know, the normal trajectory. And then I got a job playing principal flute in Akron and then in Evansville and I was subbing with St. Louis some. And like three years into my career in Evansville, I mean, I practiced probably too much at that point because I was auditioning so much. I would practice like six or seven hours a day. Wow. In addition to going to rehearsals. It was kind of crazy. So yeah. um, in March, or no, December of 2005, I was playing Nutcracker, which as many of you can probably relate to this, after you've played it so many times, you can basically play it in your sleep. And so by the third or fourth performance, I noticed that this normal scale, uh, B flat, you know, overblown to the upper register, I was having some problems with my fourth finger. And I was like, this is weird. This is a normal B flat scale, but that part. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, what's going on here? So, you know, I went by a few months and finally I went to a doctor and they told me I had dystonia, vocal dystonia. And of course, I actually knew what it was at that time because Alex Klein, who was the principal oboe in Chicago Symphony, had it. And it turns out that I had the same doctor in Chicago as he did to diagnose me. So, then I had to figure out that I probably need to, to well, our favorite word is pivot. So, so, you know, I needed to make money. And luckily, I feel lucky that I was diagnosed with it pretty early in my career. At that point, I think I was 28 years old. And so I decided I love Aspen. I think I'm going to try to apply to see what it's like to be an admin. And I'd done some of that work as working as an educator at the University of Evansville. And I like doing the admin part, but I wanted to try another part of the world besides orchestra and see if I could do opera because I wanted to learn about it. And I thought it'd be good if you're going to do arts admin that you should be well-versed in both of them. And I love the voice. So I went and I worked in Aspen for the Aspen Music Festival and Schools um, Opera Theater Center. And um, I had a very wonderful boss named Ed Berkeley. And I think at that time I was still like just rebounding and excited to try something else, but also like hadn't all settled in. And I had such a good boss that, you know, he was just so great as a boss and a leader that I think um, he really like put the stamp on it, that it's going to be okay. Like you're going to be good at this and was very supportive. So it was, it was um, it, definitely a transition. Um, but at, when I look back, I was like, I think this is what was meant to be. So it's been 
I love it. I still, I wanted to stay like in music because I love music so much and so many friends in the business. And yeah, it's been great. That's great. Um, and was your focal dystonia in your lips or was it in your fingers or did they ever determine that? It was in my, it was in my fourth finger. Your fourth finger. Okay. Yeah. It's in my fourth finger and my, they call it, they have, my fifth finger and my left hand is my compensatory, right? Pinky is the compensatory finger as they say. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and um, I can still play. I just couldn't, you know, whip off classical symphony or things like that anymore. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, like focal dystonia is this really pernicious um, affliction that's affecting a lot of people with um, very specific motion, right? So yeah. for writers, it might be their hand. Um, for musicians, it could be their lips or their fingers. And yeah. it affects these very fine muscle movements where when you go to make those specific movements, your muscles just don't respond. And they think right. it's related to overuse, but they're not sure. And there really is no cure, as you said. Um, yeah. It's in the brain. It's like, you know, we're all white, have all these wires that make our body move. And so yeah. it's like they can't figure out where that one wire is to my fourth finger, which is yeah. totally yeah. understandable. You know, yeah. what are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm really uh, glad that you were able to pivot into this new career. And, um, you know, I found as a musician that the skill set is so different, right? Like, because if you're in, in the arts, as a manager or in any position um, that's that's in that role, you are doing a hundred things at once. Nothing is coming to completion at the end of the day. And there's yeah. all this uncertainty. And with music, it's like, we're so used to doing one thing until it's perfect. And then yeah. being like, and that just isn't how the world works when you think about right. it. Um, right. So and you're uh, building up to this concert and then you play and you're like, oh, that's great. Okay, cool. I did a good job. Then, but when in management, it's like, okay, you're building the concert, but you've also thinking about like three weeks from now, I'm going to have thirty people in town, and do I have their hotel booked, and do we have, you know, all the, extra yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly, yeah. Um. So after Aspen, uh, what's your career path been like? So um, it's great. I was fortunate to go to work for the Houston Grand Opera. Um, there for that coming year after my Aspen Opera Theater Center summer um, and worked as an artist liaison and learned about like um, artistic administration from that end. I mean, it was very entry level. I was doing contract, like making sure the contracts were signed or, you know, all the itineraries, but I realized that I do love the artistic side of things and working with the artists and I had a real like, you know, passion or like sensitivity to like wanting to make sure they were okay before they went on stage. And I realized that that's kind of what I wanted to do to keep doing. So then, um, you know, that was great. And then I was invited to go back to Aspen for the summer again to do the same job I did the summer before. In the meantime, um, I was very fortunate to be offered the Aspen Music Festival School year round position. And so uh, to stay on after that summer, even though I was planning to go back to Houston in the fall. And so I just I had to, you know, decide whether that would be a good move. And I did decide to go to Aspen. I thought it'd be a good place for me to just kind of recover from dystonia, ski, learn to do things I had never done before. Yeah. And then, you know, the, after you're in Aspen for a few years, some people love it so much that they're okay to stay there for 10 years. I really admire those people. Because after a few years, I started to get a little... I need to be in a city. I feel a little claustrophobic. So I start, you know, it's so beautiful. I mean, yeah, come on, it's, that. it's beautiful, but it is yeah. a little bit insular. It's like being on an island a little bit. Yeah. And then in the winter, if it's really bad snow, you can't get out. Like it's really hard to get out. There. You're trapped there. You're yeah. trapped. So, but it's still beautiful and I love the people there. So then I went to work for the Baltimore Symphony and Artistic and I was there for six years. Wow. I, that's the majority of my career in administration so far. And I was actually just at a concert with them last night, which was beautiful. Um, and I was Marin's assistant for four of those six years in artistic planning too, Marin Alsop. Yeah. So, so that was, that was really like, you know, I just learned so much from her and from that organization and about being a strong woman, obviously, and um, artistic planning. It was great. And my former boss was, I was his, worked for him at Baltimore Symphony, Matt Spivey, for six years. And now he's CEO of the San Francisco Symphony, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. 
Yeah. Um, that's incredible. And Marin is, um, you know, uh, one of the first, I would say with uh, Joanne Folletta, one of the first female conductors to lead an American symphony for a long term and yes. um, is uh, kind of a powerhouse in the industry. And I guess I have to ask you this because a lot of artists can be very temperamental. They can be very sort of um, high maintenance. And how do you manage all of the personality issues with, with people? Did it ever get dis difficult or do you just have to have a lot of patience or how do you manage you know, artistic personalities? So I think with me, I'm, I mean, I was a musician and I guess you could call an artist. So I, I guess I can kind of like predict how they're going to feel at a certain time. I don't know. I'm not an expert at it, but I um, kind of can cur I try to be able to curve like or try to help or, you know, kind of see what the issues are that could come up or could bother someone. So it's, it's really like thinking ahead of how someone might feel in something when they're also getting really nervous for a concert. I, I don't think Marin really gets nervous anymore, but people do, you know? Um, so it's just kind of predicting like, how can I make their life like easy so they feel good all the yeah. time? So it's a lot of just hospitality. Um, some people would call it just, you know, brown nosing, but it's not really, I think it's really just like, you know, being in the know of, how people are going to feel before they go on stage or even if you're not a former musician i think you can like pretend you're going into an interview every time you go on stage right so you get nervous so people get nervous yeah 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 so my my advice is just like kind of i mean my my experience is just um and i'm not an expert at it and i you know of course there were times that i didn't you know i didn't know that they would freak out at a certain point and it was kind of like you figure out like how can i help this person so it's just a matter of like staying calm and, you know, feeling the room, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. 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 I think it does take a really uh, a special personality to just be able to not react and not, you know, because um, people do lose their temper, they get nervous and all these things happen, you know, in the chaos yeah. of putting on the arts. Yeah. Um, Mary and, never lost her temper, I will say that. I don't, yeah, right. I didn't see, yeah. I mean, she's... She's serious, but she knows her stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's uh, she's done a lot of great work there in Baltimore. Um, I don't know what her plans are after that or who they are. Do they have a new conductor there now? I believe they yes, do. Yes, they do. Jonathan Hayward. He's from Charleston, but he's been in London for a long time. He oh, wow. continued his studies in London after going to Juilliard, I think. <laughs> Um, and he's moving back to the States and he's going to be great, um, great. starting a complete, yeah, but Marin is still very much involved. I think she still does three weeks a year, at least for a few or more years. So yeah, coming up, they, I mean, yeah, I will say last night at the concert, it was really fun. You know, six years at an, or, you know, institution, you see some nights are not as full. Some nights are, you just learn about the rep that works, the rep that doesn't all this, you know, when who's going to come the nights of the week, the days of the weeks that are better, the time of the year. Mm -hmm. Anyway, last night, it's a November, what 11th is veterans day. It wasn't a, it wasn't a all American program or anything, but it was Marin's not her first time since she's been music director, but first time this season coming back. She'd had the concert the night before on Thursday, which is not, it's always a harder night to sell snowy. So Friday night comes around. She doesn't have um, Saturday or Sunday there. They just booked her for two nights and Friday night. So I'm sitting, first of all, I would say there are probably 10 empty seats in the hall. I was like, wow, wow. it was really cool to see. Yeah. And then when she came out on stage, I mean, the audience just freaked. They were screaming. So it was really fun. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, having a music director, I hadn't experienced that before. So I was just like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think uh, I had an interesting journey because I was, I, I went into arts administration. Um, it looked like to me that to build a career as like an executive director, yeah. that I would have to do a lot of work that didn't, that didn't really directly uh, relate on a daily basis with the music, which... Yeah. Um, which I was not that happy about. And then I realized it was so, there was so much going on that like very little, like not a lot of time is spent with the musicians and the music making process, unless you're like the artistic administrator. Um, right. And I also learned that I would have to live in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I want to like, I took an, an interview in Iowa and I was like, I, I don't think I can 
live in Do Iowa. That. You know, yeah. so um, yeah. um, but and the other thing that I think um, is changing in the industry, but that is still is an issue is like this idea of hierarchy and you know people with money and artists that are kind of like enshrined on this level. And I'm just like, I'm a very flat person and I treat everybody equally. Yeah. And I, I I, just couldn't like, it, it just felt weird to me to deal with that kind of hierarchy. But I think that's kind of changing now. And um, that kind of guru worship is not is not so prevalent anymore. For sure. Um, and we're, we're seeing a lot of um, changing policy and attitudes toward access and inclusion in the industry and, um, you know, what have you noticed over the past years and especially coming out of the pandemic, like what do you think um, some of the trends are that you're seeing in, in the arts world um, from yes. from just the last few years? Well, so um, I will say after uh, Baltimore, where I loved, I went to um, work for the Bay Atlantic Symphony, which is kind of, is in Atlanta City and not everybody's heard of it. It's a very small orchestra, very good orchestra of uh, professional musicians. And I did feel like I was living kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it wasn't because it was in outside of Atlantic city, but it's very remote. You know, there are a lot of people there during the summer or winter. Yeah. So then, um, after a few years, I, I got the, you know, itch to be around a little bit more thriving place and went to Memphis. And I, the reason why I talk about Memphis is because that is an orchestra that I think even before all of this, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, the empowerment of everybody um, that's not just, a, you know, not a white male um, was already working hard at that orchestra. So I learned a lot from that. And so I, um, it was just amazing. They, I mean, Memphis, as you know, is 70% Black. And so, and there are, I mean, you speak of hierarchy, but there are some very huge donors that give a lot of money. And when you're in Memphis and there's someone that believes strongly about something and they want to give a lot of money, but they want to see change at the organization. They want to see people on stage that look like, Mem you know, like it's more like Memphis. Yeah. You, you, you know, this is the, you know, this is a point where the Memphis symphony almost died before that. And this is a donor that comes in and says, okay, now we can have an endowment. Now we can see Memphis symphony live for, you know, forever. And then, you know, support the musicians with, one or three donors that want to see this change. And so you, you know, this is like, okay, this is for real. And then seeing it all that happen with the pandemic with Black Lives Matter, I'm like, this is exact, like, it was just like, great. I'm like, this is exactly what needs to happen in the world right now. Yeah. yeah. And what are some of the things that they're doing in Memphis to make the orchestra look more like their community or the composers they pr program or it could be relevant, I guess. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, their staff is um, um, very mixed right now, which is awesome. There are a lot more women on staff. Staff. There are black people on the staff, um, and it's a smaller staff. The orchestra itself. They've um, started the whole. I mean, like this is not a new thing that other orchestras doing it, but they started the fellowship thing. They they have a huge collaboration now with the University of Memphis on that, um, and. In, and then in the, the musicians, they have a few open spots right now in the orchestra that um, they're able to, because of the way the contract is now, they're able to appoint people to those jobs too. So, um, and, you know, it's probably somewhere down the line, probably in a long time, they'll have to go back to doing the auditions, which is, um, will be fine. Cause I think that Sphinx and everybody's working out a way that, that we can make this really inclusive going forward, but, um, they are, um, able to bring in more people and it's just a lot better. It feels a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, it's such a, it's such a structural problem, right? It goes back to who can afford to rent an instrument when they're in elementary school, right. Or, or middle school. Yeah. Um, and it starts there and, um, and, then, and then it goes up like, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter your race or your color or your, you know, sexuality. It's like, it's, you know, it's, you know, monetarily, it's like I go, if I'm really talented and I want to go audition for, you know, not even the youth symphony there, that's one place, but then like college and the repertoire on there is something I've never even heard of the piece before, but I do really, did really well. It's that like one of the state competitions or something in high school you know, one of the base, you know, wind on, what do they call that? Solo wind ensemble or whatever. Yeah. So then you go and you're right. like, I've never even heard of that piece and I don't have a private teacher, you know, 
what are we putting on the audition list that we aren't giving inclusion to like make sure like is it that much of a barrier that we can't make them improve that much so that by the time they're done with the university that they can you know get into college or, or grad school or whatever or win an orchestra job like yeah what, and, what are the parameters to letting somebody in to study music in college too yeah absolutely and um and when we were out i mean I, it's still this way i think but like a, a lot of orchestras are accepting more tapes they're like being more inclusive and they're not sending out your resume is not good enough please don't audition letters anymore um yeah. but then if your tape gets accepted you still have to fly to the audition right you still have to fund that um so there are still um a lot of work to be done in that area but um but I and i you know i don't think a lot enough people that have a ton of money know about that yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that is one area, like collectively, like there could be some major fundraising in the country for just an endowment that supports musicians flying around to do auditions, whether they're singers or, you know, I think there is something going with Opera America, I saw them, but, but I, and then there may be a small thing, but I feel like there needs to be like a big thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I agree. And I think, I think there might be some money through the Sphinx organization for, for that as well. But yeah. it, it should be, you know, if, if you're the Houston Symphony or the Cleveland Orchestra and you have 10 finalists, right? Like just fly them there, you know, like put up yeah. the money and do it, find a donor to, to fund that. Yeah. 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 To make it's, it more equal for everybody. You know? Yeah. I think if you make the final or your semifinal, some big work, the big orchestras, and I have, you know, it's even, even the smaller ones, it'd be nice to see them be able to do that. But the bigger ones, I think some of them, they do, if you make it to the finals or whatever, they'll pay you back. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Flight. yeah, a few of yeah. them do that already, but yeah. Yeah. So um, in looking at how you, you pivoted, I mean, one of the things I've noticed since the pandemic is, um, you know, musicians, I'm thinking of a, a, a friend of mine here in Las Vegas who was playing a Cirque show that closed over the pandemic. They were never going to reopen. And um, they may have closed right before the pandemic, but um, became a programmer now is now working for Microsoft, you know? So there's, there's, there's these artists who are just getting completely out of the arts. Some of them are going into arts management. Um, and, and some of it is like folks that are in what, what would we would think of as like the most secure jobs, like the Metropolitan Opera or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, they just, the Metropolitan Opera just, you know, um, their artists really got left behind over the pandemic. And so, a lot of them did just wake up and say, wow, this is like being in the New York Yankees if I'm a sports a sports person, but yet it's not secure. So do you see a lot of, of people transitioning artists into new careers now since the pandemic happened and pivoting? And what is your advice to somebody who might wanna do that mid-career? Yeah, so um, I'm just trying to think about this. I mean, where we were at the time, at the, I was at the Memphis Symphony during the, the heat of the pandemic. And we were, you know, thank God for the PPP loans for a lot of these organizations that were able. But I, I see what you're saying, because some of the folks that were not involved with the unionized orchestra or, you know, an actual musician or like your friend that was working for the CERC that didn't have, you know, at, at the time even didn't have steady income, like it could have been wiped out at any time. Um, it's, it was a really hard time, right? So um, even with that, um, I, I haven't, I will say I, I know a couple people that after that pandemic, they decide, you know what, I don't, I don't really like, I don't wake up, want to live and breathe playing my instrument and for in an orchestra specifically. And so they've kind of piecemealed a different kind of career together and quit their orchestra job just because they want to do something else. And then I, I also, um, found that some people learned another trade while they were at home because they were, you know, maybe they were getting paid, but they were still, they were just bored, right? Because yeah. there's only so many like duets you could do on that duet thing or, you know, participate in your orchestras. Like I'm going to play Beethoven nine by myself here at home with my earphone. You know what I mean? Right. right. So I think that a lot of it was just like, you know, people figuring out like not, not only for like survive, like, you know, adapt or die kind of mentality. You got to figure out something else I can do. But I also think it was out of boredom. So I, I, I think that it was a good, I mean, it's not good. It was terrible and it's still going on for some people, but uh, it was also like an opportunity for people to learn something else. And so yeah. there are those folks too. Yeah. 
And actually at the, at MSO, a lot of those musicians have second jobs, whether not just teaching, you know, music, but like we had someone in the trombone section, um, Wes uh, Lebo, who's also, he, um, he's a major carpenter and also, and works as like a project manager for construction company. And so like he posts a lot on Facebook. I think that really inspired people like, okay, maybe I should get something else. It's like a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I know in the symphonic world, it's like, you know, people do get tired of playing a certain repertoire um, yeah. and things like that. Um, but in in the Broadway world, in the show world, it's it's almost worse because you're literally, there are people that have been playing Phantom of the Opera for 30 years, right? Like the same show. Oh, you know, world. you've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have done that. And, uh, you know, I... Um, I started writing and I, I started pursuing other things when I was doing that on, on the road. Cause I was just like, I'm going to go insane. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, but at the same time, you're really grateful that you have this anchor that's providing you income doing what you love to do. Yeah. And then being able to play other music on the side, like the most sane ones will like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of folks in New York will like, they'll take off their show to play with, um, the form like the Stanford Symphony, which is now called Orchestra Lumos, but yeah. like they, it's less they money. But like, a, a, yeah, they need something else. You <laughs> got to have something else. It's like I can't keep playing this yeah. show eight times a week, and um, yeah. So it is, it is uh, nice when you have that ability, where you have that stability in your in your income as an yeah. artist, where you can take off and do other things, or play chamber music, or do those things that you love. And um, you know, I think we're always going to have those those big orchestras around and I worry about how the pandemic is going to affect the smaller institutions and and whether they are going to weather it. So right now you're working at um is it I can Washington? Talk about that. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah I'm at the Washington Concert Opera. Okay. Um at, which is in Washington DC. If any of you don't know it's in, it's one of, it's I would say the other opera company in the area besides there's there are a few in DC. I had no idea. First of all I just want to preface this by saying this um, city is amazing and full of opera lovers, and yeah. that's really cool. I mean, yeah. full in the amount and the to the extent that it's just a lot more than I've ever seen before or been around. So it's been really fun for me. Um, so Great. it's a small organization. It's like a um, one million dollar, one point two million dollar budget <laughs> on average over the last years. Um, we have a investment um, account as well. Um, that we have in TV Ameritrade that we have extra reserves, but it's a very small organization. We only do two concert operas on average a year, um, sometimes three, and then we have a gala, and then we're doing a bunch of opera outside events this year. Um, I would say that right now the biggest thing is like we, we used to just do two opera outsides and some opera gems, and the, the goal this year and to get try to get people back because that is a problem. And I'm, I've am i been talking to a lot of my colleagues in smaller orchestras too at the executive director. And they're just, we're hoping for, like, I'm sa I would say at least 30% decrease from before the pandemic for subscriptions coming back for all of us. And then that was last year. And we were hoping for just a little bit of a bump this year, but it's just not coming back um, and as much as we'd like to. So now it's a matter of, okay, survey, right? Find out what the issue is, what's going on. Um, word of mouth, what you're hearing from people that do come back and just, where did you really want to come back? Or like, you know, having lunches and figuring out what people's vibes are. Um, and then, um, you know, enticing people and trying to make people feel safe when they come back. And so we are seeing, like, I think for smaller organizations, uh, a definite like it's going to be hard getting all these people back in the seats so, yeah but, yeah but luckily i mean i will say like as many arts organizations not just you know butts and seats is always no one wants to perform to an empty house and people don't want to sit in an empty house right it, except maybe in, during the pandemic they did but um you know luckily most arts organizations their primary funding is not just from ticket sales so that has not wavered as much for us which is great um yeah. but just getting people back in the seats and rethinking about how you're going to do that has been the big thing yeah and when you're surveying about why people aren't coming back what are some of the um issues that are coming up for people 
Well, we're just starting ours uh, yeah. because we're hiring a company to build this whole thing. But I, what I have heard is that people have gotten used to staying at home mm -hmm. and they like it. And I'm sure you can relate to this too, because we also stayed at home and you just get used to being able to access things pretty easily from the computer. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a lot of that. And then people just not sure still about COVID and um, there's so many opportunities for people that like, there's so much going on right now. Like at the County Center, I think there's something like every night seems like going on in Washington, DC, they have a musical theater. And then the other night is opera. Like I went to see Electra last week and I came out and there were like probably 200 kids in the lobby. I'm like, well, what's going on in the other theater? So yeah. it's just, there's a lot to choose from too, I think. Yeah. I, I was wondering if arts organizations were going to, uh, try to develop a model that involved live performance and also virtual live casting streaming just because it had become a habit during the pandemic. And I don't know if that's going to become something or not, actually. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. So, I, I mean, from our perspective, um, it's very expensive to do that. Um, and not just from AFM, but also just you know, the, the AFM fees that we have to pay the musicians to do something yeah, like that, but also is, just the hiring of, the, to make sure it's good, right? Yeah. And, um, and yeah. And so I think, yeah, yeah what, what were you going to, the Met is like, that's an example. Like they do an amazing job, but I don't But they invested millions and millions of dollars to, to be able to do, do it. Yeah. yeah. It costs and they, a lot to do it well. Yeah. And I think they, they came up with a pretty innovative business model too, where they actually do pay the artists but it's like a lump sum or something every year that allows yeah. them more broadcast yeah. rights and things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, yeah, you're right. It's really hard, especially for small organizations to yeah. develop a technical capacity to do that. Um, yes. Well. yes. Um, and, and, and then obviously pay the musicians what yeah. their rates are and, you know, yeah. frankly, like what they've yeah worked hard to be able to get. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you have an AGMA contract as well with your singers? We do. American Guild of Musical Artists, which is the sister union to our union. They're yes. really like singers and ballet dancers. Yeah. Yes. We have an agreement with both AFM and AGMA, and we just were successful in negotiating our contract. So that was great for the upcoming two years. And then we'll do it again. Um, and um, yes, every the AGMA um, folks and AFM, everybody's been very wonderful to work with since I've been here. here. That's awesome. Yes. Um, and so what do you what do you do in DC for fun when you're not working at the opera? Have you found any any great restaurants or anything you do? You live in Old Town, you said, right? Yes. Uh, so there's some, well, you know, there's some great restaurants. We have a lot of good Thai food and I go for sushi. I have yeah. two dogs. I live a couple blocks from the river. So we are often at the park playing ball. Fun. And I hang out with my friends that I made when I was in Baltimore before, and some of them live around here as well. Oh, and great. obviously being able to go across the river um, to DC and go to museums anytime for free is amazing. The National yeah. Gallery of Art, African American, everything. Yeah. So that's what I, I mean, there's so much to do around here. I'm very grateful and thankful to be in this area. That's awesome. Well, I grew up in Maryland, but it was a little farther out. So um, my parents were from Bethesda. <laughs> and when I was little, we, I lived in a little town called Mount Airy. Oh, yeah. Then, um, we moved to a little, an even smaller town called Boonesboro. I don't know if you've ever heard of Boonesboro. No, is it out by Frederick or? It's like between Frederick and Hagerstown, but it's right yeah. near the battlefield. So, um, cool. and I don't know if you know the history, but um, very famous, uh, the first real soloist on the French horn was a gentleman named Barry Tuckwell. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like the Jean-Pierre Rampal of the horn. Cool. And he, I should know that. Okay. Yeah. I should know what his name is. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm just giving you the history because it's so fascinating. So there was a horn player in the Baltimore Symphony named Walter Lawson um, who was uh, got mugged outside the Weinberg Center in Frederick um, in, the, in the 70s. Uh -huh. uh, couldn't, couldn't play again. And um, he began making French horns. And so he had a little tiny shop in Boonesboro that happened to be a mile away from where I lived on the top of this mountain. And um, I discovered that when I went to a music camp and the music 
horn teacher asked us where we were from. And I'm like, well, I'm from this hick town called Boonesboro. Nobody's ever heard of it. And he like was like, seriously, you're from there? And I was like, um, you've heard of it? And so I, I met Mr. Lawson um, wow. after that experience. And uh, it was very transformative for me, that relationship. Um, he was a great mentor for me. But Barry Tuckwell was getting his horn worked on and working with Walter on developing an instrument. And somehow also became romantically involved with a, a woman in town. And so he formed an orchestra called the Maryland Symphony back in 1983. And He's he, the one who started that? Yeah, he and Amazing. A, a couple of, uh, of the arts and business leaders in Hagerstown, Maryland started that orchestra. And um, I remember going to the first season in high school and um, it was just exciting to be able to hear an orchestra without having to drive all the way to Baltimore because that's what I would do. I would I would go down to Peabody and play in the orchestra there, the prep orchestra. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, so French horn and 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 that's that all had to do with the starting of the Maryland Symphony. So. So that's um, why there are such good horn players in Maryland and in DC. We got some really good horn players here. Yeah, I I don't know if that's <laughs> what they were. There's also, you've got a lot of military bands there that have some yeah. really star players. I mean, stuff. they all come from all over the world, but that is a really cool story. Yeah, yeah. So do they still have that horn shop? Can people go and get a horn there? Or do they go to this? Is he, he died, right? Yeah, yeah. so um, it's interesting because Walter Lawson had this little shop that was literally in the middle of the woods. Um, and he and his three sons were making these French horns. And they never really, um, they were offered like, you know, the Holton company offered to buy their brand and, and make mass uh, products yeah. out of their instruments. And they always resisted that. Um, but they also never really brought on apprentices to create a, a bigger business. And then when Walter passed in 2007, I think um, the sons were not as passionate because they weren't musicians themselves. They were more craftsmen, right? right. Um, and I think uh, a gentleman named Kendall Betts, who used to play horn in the um, Minnesota Orchestra, bought the company and was making horns, um, bought their equipment, and he was doing that up in New Hampshire, and then he passed away. So I don't actually know what's going on uh, with Lawson stuff now, but um, I was very fortunate to be able to buy one of his instruments in 1991. You still have it? I still have it, and it's my main instrument. And it truly is irreplaceable. I mean, the thing is they did a lot of research and they, they invented their own alloy called Ambronze, which is that recipe of nickel, copper, brass that goes into metal, right? Like they invented their own metal. And so it was really a cool thing. And, um, you know, I don't know that you can even get Ambrons anymore or um, or all these things. So I'm very great, grateful to be playing that that instrument. Um, even do, you know, do you know a lot of people that play on those horns? You know, I do. There, in, in the 80s, um, early 90s, I think there were a lot of sections like Baltimore might have been one that played all of his horns. Atlanta was into them. Um, I don't know that there's, um, I know Greg Hustis in Dallas, uh, principal horn there for many years was playing a Lawson. But um, to me, it's like, it's really hard to play another instrument because it has such a unique sound and feel. Yeah. That it's like, I, I'm sure you know from flute playing, like you probably yeah. are like, okay, if I have a Haynes or a Brandon, it's like, it, yeah, Powell, it doesn't feel like, yeah, Powell, <laughs> yeah, Powell. So, uh, you know what it's like. Uh, yeah, but, um, yeah. But yeah. yeah so, so Maryland has a very rich history in French horn. And um, do you ever get up to hear the Maryland Symphony? I have not heard them. I should definitely go now that I have my time. When I was in Baltimore, I definitely was so busy. All oh, it's weird. Yeah. Very busy. But I, def I, I definitely should go. I've, I've heard the, and I know people that are in the orchestra. So I know yeah. it's good. Yeah. I think they have a lot of folks from DC and Baltimore that might might come up and play with them. Yeah, some of the folks actually that play with Washington Concert Opera also play in there. Oh, fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's fun. Well, you have to come visit. I do. And um, as I was telling Meg, my, my parents and my brother are all buried in the Arlington Veterans Cemetery, which is right where you could probably throw a rock and hit them from your apartment, right? So yeah. um, definitely have to visit my parents and, and you at some point in, in the future. Yeah, it would be awesome. So Thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Meg. It's been great catching up with you yeah. and um, hearing yeah. your journey. You feel free to like link my, you know, email or anything if people have questions or they want to connect. I'm happy to do that. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. So how do people connect with you on Facebook? They can friend you or message friend you. Me, or... Facebook message. And also my email is Meg, M-E-G at Sippy, S-I-P-P-E-Y.com. Meg at Sippy.com. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing thank your journey you. with us. Thank and you for we'll... having me. 
Oh, you're very welcome. And I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully soon. Yes. Talk to you soon, Michael. Thanks. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. You Bye. too. Bye. Bye.